This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Kris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? Ding, 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 ding. Day it's three. holidays are here upon us. Today is day three of our 12 nightmares before Christmas. Woo-hoo. It's weird doing this in October, but hey, that's okay. <laughs> We're pretending. We're here for you. So anyway, I guess we'll just dive right in and go, go from there. Yes? Yep. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Here we go. It's day three, and we're headed to Longview, Washington. It's a quiet, safe town located just about 50 miles outside of Portland, Oregon. It is May 15th, 1985, when Danelle Traxler is waiting for her young daughter, eight-year-old Rima, to arrive home from school after her walk home. Now, you know, she's just walking home after school. You remember those days? We did mm-hmm. the same thing. Uh, I mother... wasn't allowed to, but yeah, go ahead. Um, I did. That's fine. Mm. I tried so... once in my mind. Oh, I got yelled at. Yeah, carrying a saxophone is great. (laughs) Anyway, her mother had a strange feeling knowing that Rima was never one to be late. Danelle went outside and would travel the same path Rima Rima would be traveling, hoping to run into her. That never happened. So Danelle went home and called the police to report her eight-year-old missing. Police arrived at the home to speak to Danelle, while several other officers canvassed that neighborhood looking for the young girl. Danelle informs officers what Rima was wearing that day and emphasizes that Rima would never talk to strangers, much less get in a car with one. In fact, Rima and her family had a password that her family would use in case of an emergency. Anyone asking Rima to get in the car with them, family or even friends, would have to know the family password. Mm, Unicorn. No matter who it was, they had to have the password, and that would let Rima know it was okay and safe to get in the car. As police are working in the neighborhood, they determined that one of the neighbors who was working in the yard actually talked to Rima. Rima had stopped to chat with the woman. The woman said they talked for a moment. I think Rima was like showing her artwork. She was really in, she was kind of an artistic kid, so she liked a lot of art and drawing and painting and all that stuff. And the woman said they chatted about her artwork, and then Rima continued on her journey, walking home, alone. However, the woman told officers that Rima was walking in a different direction, and this direction was not to her home, but rather her stepdad's house. Rusty huh. Traxler is his name. Rusty and oh, Danelle. You're just going to call him Rusty Trax. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's a fun <laughs> that's a, name. Oh, well, that's terrible. Sounds like a drug addict <laughs> name. Rusty and Danelle had recently split and they had moved out, leaving Rusty angry about the separation, particularly livid about losing custody of the son they shared. Police are wondering if Rusty may have taken out his anger on his stepdaughter as he happened to see her walking home that day. He had the motive and he had the special code word. They didn't change the code words up every time? Yes, not. Police now had a prime suspect. Rusty Traxler was brought in for questioning. Rusty claimed that he would never hurt Rima. In fact, he said he never saw her on the day in question. Rusty said that the day Rima disappeared, he was home all day, hanging out on the porch and drinking beer. Rusty stated that his friend was on the porch with him that day drinking beer, and the friend would tell police that it was true. He was there all day with Rusty. Oh, except for the small bit of time when the friend left him alone. He went to go run an errand. I believe it was to pick up more beer and cigarettes. Rusty agreed to take a polygraph, and he failed. So Rusty took another two polygraphs, and he failed both of those. Now, while they're not admissible in court, as we know, it doesn't look too good for Rusty. These polygraph tests, and because he failed, this allowed police to get a search warrant. 
investigators would go in and search his home, and sadly, they found nothing. For now, all the police could do was wait. We know that the first few hours of any investigation are crucial, so when the days kept passing without finding Rima, their hopes were dimming that Rima would be found alive. Days became years, and police were no closer to finding Rima or Rima's abductor than they were the day it happened. However, it happens again on November 21st, 1996. Now, this is 10 years later in the small area. 12-year-old Kara Rudd disappeared on her way home from school. That morning, her stepfather had dropped off Kara for school along with her cousin, Yolanda Patterson. Police learned that Kara never made it actually inside the school, so they need to talk to Yolanda and find out exactly what occurred after the young girls were dropped off by the stepfather. Yolanda would share a frightening story. She said that the two of them were sitting outside the school around 7.15 in the morning and waiting for the doors to open. Nobody was yet at school, or rather the doors weren't open for kids. As they were waiting, a car pulled up and rolled down the window. The man inside said he wanted to speak to Kara. Kara went to the car and climbed into the passenger seat. After a few minutes, Kara got out and went back over to Yolanda and said to her, Hey, if I skip school today, will you cover for me? Kara then went back to the car, hopped in, and then they left the school parking lot. The plan was that Kara would arrive back to school just in time to hop on the bus and make it home. But that day, she never showed up. Yolanda would have to confess exactly what occurred that day, revealing to police and Kara's mom that the man who pulled up to get Kara was a man by the name of Joe Condro, a family friend. A few days earlier, Kara told Yolanda that Joe, or Uncle Joe, as she called him, (laughs) was going to help him get a kitten for her mother for her birthday. Yolanda figured that this is what Kara and Joe were going out to do that day. Doesn't though, Jen, he's not a good guy. Well, oh, oh, I know he doesn't, but it makes sense why she would go with him. I'm Mm -hmm. just saying. People always worry about stranger danger, and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's not the problem in most cases. Please pull in Joe for answers. Joe appeared heartbroken to hear about Kara missing. Joe admitted that he was at school that morning and that he did see both Kara and Yolanda and even spoke with Kara, but then he left for the day, not seeing either of them again. Joe said that he went out job hunting that morning, and then after that, he went to his ex-wife's house. This was around 1130 in the morning. The two of them then spent the day together, and she would confirm his alibi. She confirmed to uh, police that he did, in fact, come over and what time he got there and all that good stuff. Now, problem is, no one could confirm that he was actually job hunting that morning as no one saw him or that he'd even put in a resume or a job application. None were dropped off at any of the area places that he had claimed to visit. Police head over to the neighborhood where the school is located to see if anyone recalled seeing Kara that morning. A witness came forward saying that she saw a young girl that morning and it stuck out to her because the girl was walking away from the school rather than to the school. So she made a note of it in her mind, which I I get that probably would, you know, kind of stick out in her head. Mm -hmm. The woman claimed that she watched the girl as she climbed into a car and left with a man who was driving the car. The good thing she did remember was the car because it was unusual. It was a Firebird in an older model. Now, this is the exact same kind of car Joe Condro drove. And now he is the prime suspect. I would have pegged him first anyway, from what you're telling me. Joe Condra was born May 19, 1959 in Marquette, Michigan, and was adopted at birth by John and Eleanor Condra. The family would move to Castle Rock, Washington, which was where he was raised. As Joe was growing up, there were signs that something was not quite right. He displayed traits of psychopathy from a young age. He was involved in fistfights often. He had very poor self-control. And he began killing the neighborhood pets. Mm. That's terrible. Like, yeah. what a nice guy. He claimed that he started drinking at the very young age of 10 years old, something that he would struggle with throughout his life, alcoholism and alcohol abuse. He also allegedly assaulted several young girls when he was just as young and began having violent fantasies as he grew up. While he was growing up, he said that he was not right, and he never felt anything when he committed these crimes. So he, even at this younger age, he knew something was not right about himself. He later also showed many of the baffling and seeming contradictory 
qualities of criminals with antisocial personality disorder. And despite some differences in physical appearance, personal persona, and the MO of his crimes, he had many such traits in common with our friend, not really, serial killer Ted Bundy. Like Bundy, despite his personal instability and tendency uh, towards cr- crime and violence, Condro was able to come off as quite charming and personable. He was very well liked. He had a lot of charisma. This allowed him to win the trust of those around him, which he used in the commission of his crimes, often perpetrated against young daughters of his friends. Condro was also aware on some level that his actions were immoral and monstrous, even apparently able to empathize with families' desires for justice. Yet, he said he could not stop himself and compared his drive to violent crime as an adrenaline rush. As a young man, his crime career began. Drunk driving, drug dealing and abuse, auto theft, and more were now part of his everyday life. Joseph would go on to have six children, none of which he cared for as he couldn't tear himself away from drinking long enough to get up and get a job. He compared himself to an alligator just waiting to attack its prey. He legit said that. That's disgusting. Police arrested Joe Condro on charges of tampering with a witness. That would be his wife, by the way, ex-wife rather. With Joe staying put in jail, police spread out to find Kara and they get a lead immediately. As police make contact with all of Joe's friends, one mentioned an area known as Mount Solo. It's a remote area where Joe and his friend used to go and drink and hang out. On a whim and a gut feeling, investigators head there hoping to find Kara alive. After only a few hours of searching, an officer makes a grisly discovery. Deep within the forested area, they discover a rusted out Volkswagen with a bra and a shirt inside the vehicle. The t-shirt was identical to the one Kara was wearing the day she disappeared. As they looked closer, located under the car was a body. It was Kara. An autopsy would confirm that the 12-year-old had been sexually assaulted and strangled. A semen sample from Kara's body was confirmed to belong to Joe Condro. While investigating Kara's case, investigators learned that Condro was a good friend of Rima Traxler's stepfather, Rusty, remember 10 years earlier. The two had been childhood classmates and friends, and in fact, the friend that Rusty was drinking with on that front porch that day, Jen, it was him. He was drinking with Joe Condro, who... Incidentally, was called Uncle Joe by Rima and her little sister. Since the police were always suspicious of Rusty Traxler, Joe was never even looked at as a suspect. The case against Joe for the death of Kara Rudd was solid, but they had absolutely nothing on the disappearance of Rima Traxler. In fact, Joe was once living in the garage of the Rudd family home, but was kicked out due to his constant drinking. This is how Kara and her sister came to know Joe. He was their family friend and, as they called him, Uncle Joe. Investigators needed to tie him to the disappearance, so they needed to sweeten the pot for him. This means, you know what this means, happens all the time. This means taking the death penalty out of the mix in exchange for a confession. Mm -hmm. Joe Condro would have to give authorities all the details about Kara and Rima in order to get the deal. So here we go. Joe used the code word unicorn to get Rima in the car with him and told him that they're going to go swimming at a local swimming hole that day. She was excited to go swimming, so she hopped in the car. Once they arrived in the area, Joe told her to take off her clothes to go swimming. And once she was in the water, he hit her in the head with a rock. When she was hit by the rock, she started screaming and fearing that someone would hear her. He strangled her. Once he was done with her, he told detectives he hid her body under a tree near the swimming hole. Investigators look and fail to find her. In fact, Rima is still missing today. Rima's mother is convinced that Joe Condra was lying about the whole thing. She kind of believes that maybe Rima's still out there. Mm. I I hope she is. 
It was May 15th, 1985. Condro, who was just 25 years old at the time, went to the store for beer and cigarettes. It was here that he noticed Rima walking home from St. Helens Elementary School. In fact, just that morning, Joe was hanging out on the front porch of Rusty's home, Rima's stepfather. The two had been friends for a long time, as I mentioned earlier. Joe would tell police that he made a deal with himself. And that was that if she gets in the car, he would take her to the swimming hole on Germany Creek, west of town. He raped her, bludgeoned, and strangled little Rima. He then claimed, claimed he buried her body under a tree. But police searched, and they never have been able to locate her body. Little side note here, when the family was looking for Rima, her mother, Danelle, went to Joe because they were friends, you know, and, and asked Joe if he had seen her daughter. And of course, he says no, and he's trying to comfort her. She even said, can I use your phone? I need to call police to report her missing. And Joe, of course, let her, you know, use his phone. Unbelievable. Like everything was normal. Eleven years later, he struck again. This time, he was not immediately successful. He picked up Kara and her friend. That was Yolanda. Now, this is prior to killing Kara. And think about if you were this poor girl. He picked up Kara and her friend. It was 1996, a chilly autumn day when Joe took the girls to an abandoned house that was located right off the Columbia River. And it was his plan that day to rape and kill both the girls. But for some reason, he decided to not go through with it. So that day, Kara and her friend lived. However, November 21st, 1996, he would try again, and this time Kara would not survive. Just like before, Joe took Kara to the abandoned house. He beat her, raped her, and strangled the 12-year-old. He then took her to Mount Silo, where he hid her body under a rusted shell of an abandoned car in the woods. The school called Kara's mom to inform her that Kara was not at school, and the police were called right away. Joe was already at home, changing his clothes and destroying evidence that he had actually had on his person. Once again, he was confident, believing her body would not be found. He was wrong. It took 49 days, but they did find the little girl. Over the years, police have went back again and again to Joe, trying to get more information about some of the murders that they believe he is responsible for in and throughout the area. They believe he could be responsible for as many as 70 unsolved Holy cow. murder cases. 70? 70. 7-0. Seven, 7-0. Zero. Seven, zero. Correct. Uh. Yet, all he would do is smile and say he, won't, he didn't want to talk about it. No, that's his response. Such as in the early 1980s, there were several unsolved disappearances of young girls in the state of Washington. There was a little girl by the name of Chilla Silvernails who vanished in 1982 when she was on the way to the school bus stop. It's Her- Chilla, C H? Mm-hmm, Chilla, C H I L A, Silver Nails. Huh. I'm thinking she's indigenous because of the, I, I guess, maybe take that out. I don't know. So Chilla Silvernails vanished in 1982 when she was on the way to the bus stop for school. Her body was found just one day later. She had been raped and strangled. At the time of her disappearance, her mother was dating a man by the name of Joe Condro. Her mom was dating him. On March 3rd, 1999, Joseph Condro was sentenced to two life sentences with no possibility of parole. If he could change just one thing, now this gives me the creeps. If he could change just one thing, Joe Condro says, he would have been more careful in hiding his final victim's body. Then he'd be free <laughs> now to rape and kill again. Condro would claim that one of the things he learned early on, and this all makes sense, I never really thought about it, what he learned early on was that police rarely track down a killer if they can't find a body. With no body, it simply could be a missing persons case rather than a cold-blooded murder. And he learned that from little Rima. And so that's, he was hoping that would be the case with Kara. And it wasn't. For Joe Condro, he managed to hide Rima so well that she's never been found. Quote, I figured if I could take her and bury her in a place far enough away, there'd be no way they'd go find her and looking for her there. I was right. At the age of 52, Joe Condro died in prison of liver failure and hepatitis C. And with that, all the secrets went Went with him. Damn it. I hate that. I don't like that ending. Oh, yeah. Oh, here's what I wanted to add to John Douglas, our good friend, John Douglas. He's featured in the book, uh, The Killer Across the Table. He does a little deep dive because Joe, you know, how he did it was he was good friends with the families. And I mean, 
that's you, a lot of they the times should, how it happens. Yeah, exactly. And you would think that would be their number one suspect. You know, let's look at somebody close to him. But it's he's he conveniently, you know, it's Uncle Joe. It's our buddy Uncle Joe. He'd never do anything like that. Just I know. shocking. I mean, you know, you, you try to protect your child and, you know, stranger danger, like you said. But what about the friend that's over, you know, drinking beer with your stepdad or working on a car with your dad or, you know, hanging out with your brother or whatever the case may be? Those are just terrible. I believe it's less than 1% of actual stranger danger abductions. Mm -hmm. I actually want to say it's less than half a percent. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I that's just off the top of my head. I remember covering it a while ago and I get, you know, how. When you're in a subdivision and like little Facebook posts, people mm-hmm. like it's this subdivision, our subdivision and many have Facebook groups, right? That you can mm-hmm. go and everybody knows everybody's business. And did you see this here? Whatever. Well, the past couple of weeks, we've had somebody keep posting about be careful of stranger danger. I saw a white truck in the neighborhood that doesn't belong here. Be careful. Stranger danger. Talk to your mm. kids about stranger danger. Mm-hmm. And it kills me one of the i'm gonna have to just go on and say listen i do a true crime podcast you know that casual <laughs> drop i'm like it's not about stranger danger it's it's the kid your I mean, kids it, are more apt to get yeah hurt by it, it somebody does happen that they know. it does happen but i think they it also does. have to be but you know if if your kids you know uncle what unquote pulls up and says hey let's go swimming he wouldn't you know, okay no. mm-hmm. oh i know and and they know the passcode mm-hmm. or, or the password right mm-hmm. Yep. Terrible. Yeah. So anyway, that is the story of Joe Condro on this, the third day of the 12 Nightmares Before Christmas. Well, I can't say I'm sad that Joe has left this earth, but I am sad. But you, that... know, he, you know he did before. You know mm-hmm. he did. Ugh. Yes. Ugh. I am sad that there's a lot of people that don't know where their kids are because of him. So. Just smarmy. All right, Jen, I guess it's back to you tomorrow, day four, four, four. And uh, you're going to bring us a story for tomorrow. But until then, until then, I guess, uh, hey, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. Happy holidays. To you. Happy holidays. (laughs) To you. (laughs) That's it. That's all we got. All right. Uh, See you. Bye-bye. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Bertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production.